So tonight I'm pleased to introduce Andrew Del Banco to Politics and Prose. Del Banco is the Alexander Hamilton Professor of American Studies at Columbia University, as well as the author of many notable books, including College, Melville, The Death of Satan, Required Reading, The Real American Dream, and The Puritan Ordeal. In The War Before the War, Del Banco shows that the United States of America was really two nations, one slave and one free, and, more than anything else, the fugitive slave was the embodiment of this disunion. By enacting the Compromise of 1850, with its infamous fugitive slave law, Congress, instead of preserving the Union, set the nation on the path to civil war. The story of fugitive slaves illuminates the path to the Civil War and reminds us of the lasting effects of the terrible legacy of slavery. Eric Foner, author of Reconstruction, writes, With a rare combination of in-depth historical research and an unmatched command of the 19th century American literature, Andrew Delbanco shows the story of the coming of the Civil War and emancipation. He highlights the role of fugitive slaves in forcing the slavery issue onto the center stage of politics but manages to treat all the protagonists in the long struggle over human bondage with compassion and insight. The result is an original rendering of the nation's greatest crisis. Now, please join me in welcoming Andrew Del Banco. Well, thank you very much. Is this machine working and you can hear me? Thank you. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, feels a little bit like a homecoming because I think I've been here twice before and I want to believe that means it wasn't a total waste of time the first two times and we'll hope it won't be tonight. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you for coming out. Uh, it's my impression that uh, there's been some other stuff going on in our country the last couple of weeks that has probably been on your minds as well as on mine and the fact is that this book is about as fresh off the presses as it can get. It was published yesterday, um, and uh, there have been a few pre-publication reviews, but nothing in the conspicuous places, so I appreciate it. It's kind of an act of faith that you have come out and uh, hoping that there might be something of interest here. Um, you know, it strikes me, as it struck me as I was writing this and as I've been thinking about how to talk about it, that there are certain words that unfortunately are still extremely salient to our present circumstances. Words like uh, discrimination, racism, white supremacy, and in a way the, the word behind all those words, the word slavery. And we use them all the time and I think there's a sense in which the more we use them, the less we feel what they really signify. Uh, in the course of working on this book, which has the subject of slavery at its very heart, I encountered uh, a talk given by one of the fugitive slaves, that is, someone who had been enslaved uh, and managed to break away and achieve freedom in the North. William Wells Brown, not quite as well known as Frederick Douglass and some of the others, but a very extraordinary person in the first half of the 19th century. And I came across a talk that he gave to a group of um, abolitionists in New England, and he said to them, if you want me to speak about slavery, I would whisper to you about it. Slavery cannot be represented. It can never be represented. And that comment struck a, a nerve with me, as I expect it may with you. It seems to me we ought to just get it out there right, right in front at the beginning of these remarks that this is a subject that nobody can really grasp or say anything altogether intelligible about. Nobody who hasn't experienced it. It's like talking about a life-threatening illness if you've been spared from that ordeal. Or talking about combat if you've never been in combat. And so I kind of wanted to say up front that I feel a certain, I'm not sure I want to say embarrassment, but I certainly feel a certain inadequacy 
to present myself as somebody who has insight into this topic. Uh, I'm trying my best to wrap my mind around it, but that's really all anyone in my position can do. Now, with that said, <clears throat> as a kind of disclaimer, as you can anticipate, I'm nevertheless going to go ahead and say some things about it. Um, and what I want to start out by saying is that we want to believe, and it's kind of understandable that we want to believe it, that we have a unified country. Uh, we've been reminded in recent years that maybe it's not as unified as we would like to think it is. But w w my sort of initial proposition is that when the founding fathers, as we refer to them, came together in Philadelphia in 1787, they weren't really representing an incipient nation. They were representing two nations. Thirteen disparate colonies that had been governed by Great Britain got the idea that it might be beneficial for all of them to come together into one union. But the reality was, and they knew it, that for half of them, roughly half of them, slavery, the institution of human bondage, was the bedrock of the economy and of culture and of every aspect of life. And in the other half, which is not necessarily to make a moral distinction that the good people were all in the North and the bad people were all in the South, but for various complex reasons that we can talk about if you like, in the Northern colonies, slavery was clearly on the road to extinction. So they came together and they had this situation, and out of these two separate nations, they created a single nation. People refer to what happened in Philadelphia as a miracle, and it was a kind of miracle of compromise and negotiation and giving and taking. And one of the compromises that was, <clears throat> was very clear that they had to make from the very beginning was, you know, how were they going to deal with the problem if they had these two countries? How were they going to deal with the problem if an enslaved person in the southern half chose to try to achieve freedom by taking him or herself physically from the south to the north. How were they going to deal with this problem? And it was quite clear, I mean, this is, you know, nobody can prove that the nation could not have been put together without this, but it's my conviction that it couldn't have been. It was quite clear that they had to make a deal on that issue if they were going to put this country together. So they established what we might think of as a kind of uh, extradition treaty, between the southern half and the northern half, and that was expressed in the United States Constitution as the Fugitive Slave Clause. And I'm not going to read you the language of it, but the gist of it was that any person owing service or labor in one state could not escape that obligation by removing to another state, but would be obliged to return, to be returned to the person to whom such service or labor was due. Now, to be strictly accurate, this clause did not refer exclusively to African Americans who lived in a state of slavery. It also <laughs> applied to white indentured servants and apprentices who might seek to escape their contractual obligations. But everybody understood that the main thrust of it was as is captured in the name, to deal with the fugitive slave problem. Because the reality is that throughout all of human history, enslaved people seek freedom. And this was true from the very beginning of the slave trade. You see these blood-curdling images of enslaved people in the west coast of Africa being equipped with neck halters, uh, with spikes on them so that if they attempted to run through the underbrush to get back inland from the coast, they would be snagged in the, in, the, in the bramble and would be unable to escape. The problem of fugitive slaves was there from the very beginning, and it was there during the Revolution when many enslaved African-American persons uh, in what became the United States fled to the British because the British 
made promises to them that they could achieve freedom if they abandoned their masters. And it was there at the time of the creation of the Union at the time of the Constitution. So when they included this clause in the Constitution, when one delegate from South Carolina went back to Charleston afterwards, and his job was to convince his fellow Carolinians to sign on to the Constitution, and said, I've got good news for you, paraphrasing, we have achieved the right to recover our slaves from anywhere in America where they may seek refuge. And I want to pause on that for just a moment, because... That word refuge is interesting to me. This, this was the same person who was claiming that slavery was a good thing. Slavery was good for the enslaved people as well as for the enslavers. Uh, so you might wonder why he was willing to admit that these people were seeking refuge from something that they were supposed to appreciate. Anyway, uh, he spoke too soon. It became clear over the first 75 years or so of the existence of the Union that enslaved people were not going to stop seeking freedom and that these words in the Constitution were all fine and dandy, but enforcing them was an altogether different matter. The Constitution never stated who would enforce them. Was it the job of the state governments, of local police authorities, of the federal government, who exactly was going to return these people seeking freedom to their enslaved condition. And this problem became more and more acute as the decades wore on, as the, as the nation expanded westward and the border between the slave states and the free states got longer and more porous, more and more slaves continued to flee, particularly from the upper south to the north seeking freedom. By the 1830s and 1840s, a significant number of them were speaking up about their experiences, supported by northern abolitionists going on lecture tours throughout the north to try to get people to understand what the reality of slavery really was. And by the 1840s, some of those reminiscences were being published in the form of memoirs. We know them now as the fugitive slave narratives that have become a a recognized part of American literature taught to many of your children in their college classes. And by 1850, the problem of the fugitive slave, from the point of view of the slaveholders, had become an emergency. There, was, there were other aspects to the emergency. The, the, the big issue, as you'll remember from your study of American history, was whether or not slavery would be permitted to expand into the Western territories or whether it would be contained where it existed. The federal government, according to the Constitution, had no authority to interfere with slavery where it existed by state law. But the Republican Party, which came into existence, that may be a little ironic that there was the Republican Party, the Republican Party that came into existence in the 1850s, the the key plank of the Republican platform was that slavery would not be permitted to expand into the territories. So in 1850, it looked like the nation was going to come apart over this issue. The secession that we know took place in 1861 looked to contemporaries as if it was going to happen in 1850. In order to try to stop that from happening, in order to try to hold this nation together, and I, I'm conscious of the fact that, you know, speaking about this issue in front of you here tonight, it's sort of the first time, I think, maybe in our lifetimes that we can vaguely imagine the possibility that the United States could actually come apart under irrepressible internal pressures. That wasn't something that I was even conceivable when I was a kid or when I was a young person. I still don't want to believe that it's conceivable, but it's something that has probably crossed all of your minds. And I don't think it's saying too much that one of those internal forces is continues to be the problem of racism in the United States, which is more acute in some places than in others, though I think it exists everywhere. 
unfortunately, I, I take that as meaning I've just said something true. I wish it, I wish it weren't true. So they wanted to prevent that from happening. So the Congress of 1850 made a deal with itself, and it passed what we now know of as the Fugitive Slave Law, which was an attempt to put teeth into that clause of the Constitution, which had proven unenforceable for all those years. It was a merciless law. It denied an accused fugitive. Someone would be accused, let's say, in New York or Boston or Rochester uh, or somewhere in New Jersey of having run away from their slave owner. It denied that person the base, the most fundamental right in the Anglo-American legal tradition, the right of habeas corpus. That is the right to contest the legality of your detention. It denied that person the right to a jury trial. It denied that person the right to testify for him or herself. It created a whole new class of federal officials called commissioners who had the authority without going to a court with a federal or state judge to make the judgment over whether this person was in fact a fugitive and to order that person returned to the person who claimed to own him or her. And it criminalized anybody in the local community who came to the aid of such a fugitive was committing a federal crime. First time in history that that was federalized as a criminal act. So this law was passed by the Congress in August of 1850, and it was signed by the president in September of 1850. A New Yorker who didn't like slavery, who was sort of personally un- uneasy with slavery, but who, like many others, and we could talk about that if you like later when we get to Q&A, like many others felt that regardless of his personal convictions, he had to commit himself to this law in order to hold the country together. The central irony of the story that I try to tell in this book is that this law, which was designed to hold the country together, had the unintended effect of accelerating the process by which the country came apart. Millard Fillmore was his name. What happened was that suddenly people in the North who might have had sort of vague feelings about discomfort about the fact that there was slavery in the South, but who had persuaded themselves that it had nothing to do with them, right? I live in Boston, or I live in New Bedford, or out in the Berkshires, or wherever. But slavery's got nothing to do with me. There's a few black people in my community. They are free. They may live among themselves, and we may not have too much to do with them, but they're not enslaved. So slavery has nothing to do with me. And there had been people for years who had tried to point out that all these good, innocent northerners were wearing clothing made out of cotton that was harvested by slaves. They were putting sugar in their coffee and their candy that was harvested by slaves. Ralph Waldo Emerson says at one point, no one tasted blood in the sweets. And as many of you, I'm sure, will remember, the, when the Industrial Revolution came to the North, to New England, the textile mills were turning slave-grown cotton into cloth, which became an important export for the United States. So the, and the banks in, New Eng- and in Boston and New York were, were financing the plantation owners. So the reality was that slavery was not a Southern problem, It was, as Lincoln put it in his great second inaugural address, it wasn't Southern slavery, it was American slavery. But it took this law, this 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, to really wake people up to this reality. Emerson, whom I mentioned a couple minutes ago, said the Fugitive Slave Law was like a sheet of lightning at midnight. It suddenly illuminated the moral reality of what mid-19th century America was all about. He was a good phrase maker. He also called that law a university to the people. The law taught them 
who they were and what their responsibilities were. So suddenly this law, which was meant to pull everybody together and calm down the situation and put slavery on the back burner again, as had been done over and over and over again, actually brought it to the fore and forced the issue into, into the open, in large part, of course, because black people insisted on continuing to seek freedom. And so suddenly the New Englander who might have thought I got nothing to do with this was watching a black person who was a neighbor who might have lived in New England for 20 or 25 or 30 years running for his life down the street or being taken in shackles to the local jailhouse. And then after the commissioner said, yeah, you belong to so-and-so in Savannah, Georgia or in, in, in Richmond, Virginia, taken to the, to the pier, put on a ship and returned to a condition of servitude. The argument that I make in this book, and I I use the word argument, but I, I, I want to believe that actually the book tells a story more than makes an argument, is that this was really the spark that lit the fuse that led over the next 10 years to the Civil War. It's kind of a parlor game to argue over what was the most important cause of the Civil War, what was the secondary cause of the Civil War. But what I can say to you is that when you get to 1860-61 and you re- if you read the secession documents from South Carolina, for instance, they make it very clear that one of the most, the, the greatest provocations to the secessionists was the refusal of the North to honor what Southerners considered its constitutional responsibility to return fugitive slaves to their owners. So I do think the fugitive slave issue has been a somewhat underestimated factor in the coming of the Civil War. And the story of the 1850s, which I try to tell in this book, is the story of many brave men and women continuing against long odds to seek freedom, to tell their stories in public at risk of being sent back into servitude. And eventually, as we know, it was the Civil War itself that finally resolved the problem. Now, I just said finally resolved the problem, and I want to kind of go back and revise that statement. The sad truth is I think we all know this, we live in a country where the problem has not been finally resolved. The Civil War did destroy the institution of slavery, and we can talk about the process by which that happened. In some way, you could say it destroyed it because suddenly, literally hundreds of thousands, even millions of enslaved people became fugitives as the Union Army advanced deeper and deeper into Confederate territory. And Mr. Lincoln slowly, somewhat reluctantly, made the decision that the notion that we were going to return these people to their lawful masters was just off the table as the war proceeded. So the logic of the war itself drove the Union Army to become an agent of liberation. And the slaves themselves became agents of liberation of themselves. And as I'm sure many of you know, before the end of the war, almost 200,000 African Americans enlisted in the Union Army, many of them former slaves, and put their lives on the line in order to prosecute that war that brought slavery to an end. So that, in very short compass is the story I try to tell in this book. It's not exactly an unknown story, but I think, I hope, that I've told it from a certain perspective that might make it fresh and vivid. And despite what I said at the very beginning of this talk, I would like to believe that maybe this book gets us a little closer to understanding the depth of the moral problem that America was saddled with from the very beginning, as it has often been called the original sin of the United States, which Lincoln believed was expiated by the war itself, in which I would remind you, and this is something also hard to wrap one's mind around, 
the historians are always revising upward the estimates, almost a million people died in the Civil War. A million people in a nation of 30 million. I'm not a math whiz, but you can do the math, right? So that would be the equivalent of 10, 12, 15, 20 million people if you, count, if you add the casualties, the people who were psychologically or physically mutilated by the war, you're getting up into numbers that we could not begin to fathom if we brought them into our present context. So that's what it took to destroy the institution of slavery. And this book is perhaps a, a overly audacious effort to tell the story that I've just tried to summarize in about 15 minutes. I'm not sure how long I've been standing here. Uh, it's not exactly a light reading. Um, it is filled with horror and tragedy and sadness, but it is also filled with heroism and humor in the face of the most difficult circumstances of life. And I've tried to write it in such a way that a person could actually read it rather than just kind of consult it as a reference book. If there's time, do we have a couple more minutes? If there's time, I thought I might just read just like, like two or three paragraphs from different places in the book to try to give you a little bit of a flavor of what you would encounter in it if you should be so foolish as to acquire a copy of it. Um, here is one passage most of these words are not my own, uh, about one of the most notorious slave traders of the 1830s and 1840s, a man named Hope Slatter, who had a slave auction house in Baltimore, not too far from here. Uh, and I just, I'm just going to read you my account of him briefly and then his, his own words that he placed in an advertisement through which he wanted to convince people who had slaves to sell or wanted to buy slaves that he was the guy. He was the, he was the n number one dealer that they should go to. He described the building where this slave pen was constructed as if it were a luxury hotel. And these are his words, planned and arranged upon the most approved principle with an eye to comfort and convenience not surpassed by any establishment of the kind in the United States. Sounds like, a, like an ad for, uh, you know, the Sofitel or something, right? And here are some details. These are his words in the ad. The male and female apartments are completely separate. The rooms for both are large, light, and airy, and all above ground with a firm large yard for exercise, with pure delightful water within doors. In erecting and planning this edifice, the subscriber, that is Mr. Slatter, had an eye to the health and cleanliness of the slaves, as well as the many other necessary conveniences. Having a wish to accommodate my southern friends, I'm determined to keep them on the low, lowest possible terms at 25 cents per head a day and furnish them with plenty of good and wholesome provisions. I also will receive, ship, or forward to any place at the request of the owner and give it my personal attention. It's, you know, one has to read that quite a few times before it really sinks in, but this was perfectly conventional language that you would find in uh, newspapers uh, throughout, throughout the land. And now I want to read you something quite different, which is a little bit of a hint of, a, of another theme in this book that I haven't really talked about tonight. And that is that, <laughs> I'm not, let's see how I can put this economically. It's quite clear to us in retrospect where the good and where the evil lay in this story. I would hope and be very, I would, I would expect that nobody in this room could possibly make 
any kind of moral argument on behalf of slavery as a defensible form of human relations. And yet, if we try to think ourselves back into the past, which is a hard thing to do, one of the takeaways from the book that I hope you would take with you is that there were people of goodwill who hated slavery, who understood the depth of the sin of slavery, who nevertheless could not see a way out, could not see a solution to the problem, a political solution, that is, or a a way of convincing people by appealing to their better instincts that slavery should be something that we should relinquish. People who feared that if the if, if the conflict between North and South were pushed to a certain point, the result would be a fratricidal war of inconceivable proportions, and who feared, and this is, this is the hard part of thinking about the past, because we want to remember that people in the past did not know what was going to happen. Just as we do not know, we didn't know yesterday what was going to happen last night, we don't know what's going to be the, what are going to be the consequences of what happened last night. So some of these people thought, you know, if we push this and we have a war between North and South, the South will walk away, they will win, or Northerners will choose not to fight, which in fact was probably a pretty good guess in 1850, because there were a lot of Northerners who didn't want to fight in 1860, and that what we might be doing, in fact, would be to authenticate the slave culture of the South and allow it to go its own way as a slave-based empire that could then expand into Mexico or the Caribbean or Cuba. So in other words, what I'm trying to suggest is that although this, this is a story about good and evil, there were good people who were caught in the middle who did not know what to do. Just as I think many of us don't quite know what to do. So one such person, I just, just a few sentences about him, Turns out, oddly enough, to have been the grandfather of the great poet T.S. Eliot. That's the way in which most people know him. He was a Unitarian minister, grew up in Boston, and went to St. Louis to preach from the pulpit in St. Louis. And he hated slavery. And he took personal risks in his life. Uh, When the Civil War came, he took, he harbored a fugitive slave in his own home at considerable risk to his own family. A mob could have broken it at any moment and torn this, this um, refugee away and attacked him and his family. But so he was a man, in my view, of personal courage. And yet he never signed on to the radical anti-slavery movement of the 1840s. Uh, and this is what I have to say about him. Just read you a few sentences. Eliot stayed in St. Louis but with no illusions. Over the best and most pampered slave, he wrote after the Civil War, the sword of uncertainty always hung, suspended by an invisible hair from which it came to pass that under the best of circumstances, the best condition of slavery was worse than the worst condition of freedom. So this is not somebody who had any doubts about whether slavery was a a sin or not. The journal he kept from the 1840s through the Civil War reveals the mind of a morally resolute New Englander coming to grips with the sins of a slave society from within. He lived in Missouri, which was a slave state, rather than decrying them from without. In other words, it was one thing to attack slavery from Concord, Massachusetts, as Emerson and Thoreau and other famous writers did. It was another thing to attack it publicly from St. Louis, Missouri, when you were living in the middle of it. And that was a point I wanted to drive home. And let me just read you briefly from his own journals. I never pass by the slave jails on Al- Olive Street without saying, sometimes aloud, may the curse of God abide on this vile traffic. Yet I have spoken of it in public comparatively seldom, only once or twice each year. 
in conversation more freely, has it been through want of moral courage? That is, he's interrogating himself. He's asking himself, what is the right thing here? And then he writes, I found this very striking when I encountered it. Ten or five years ago, I had only to come out as an abolitionist. And although I would have been required to leave my place here, that is, he would have been required to leave his pulpit, he would have been required to abandon the school that he had organized for the education of black children. Although I would have been required to leave my place here, I could have returned to friends and kindred in Boston with the honors of a martyr, covered with glory, and with the certainty of good settlement, that is, of a good job, of a good position. And here's the key sentence. But my gain would have been the only gain. That is, I could have rescued myself from this situation, but would I be doing more good by going back to New England and becoming an abolitionist or by staying here in St. Louis and doing what I can within the existing circumstances? It was a hard question. And one of the things I try to do in this book is to convey the heart, the difficulty of the question. Last passage, and then we'll open it up for conversation if you're so inclined. This is how I conclude the introduction of the book. Americans before the Civil War were living in circumstances and with beliefs very different from our own. But in trying to hold their country together amid the conflict over slavery, they were as fallible as we are, uncertain of when to make a stand and when to give way to fight another day. I mean, there's not really any analogy to what I'm talking about here, but, you know, you might ask yourself, the Democratic Party, if I could editorialize for a moment, the Democratic Party now has, I'll allow myself to say, thank God, recovered some political power in Washington. And it's now going to have a debate with itself over how far to push to the left, to the progressive end of the spectrum, or how much to accommodate and stay in the center, and which is the better strategy for the long-term benefit of the people it wants to represent. That's not an easy question. And I'm sure that all of you have strong views on that question. But I th I'd like to think we could agree it's not an easy question. So that's the kind of question I'm interested in this period. In that sense, the questions they faced were not so different from those we face. What to do when law comes into conflict with justice? The fugitive slave law was passed by the Congress. It was upheld by the courts. It was unjust. What do you do under those circumstances? Civil disobedience, nonviolent resistance, violent resistance, leave the country. What do you do under those circumstances? The problem of the 1850s, how for Southerners to preserve slavery without destroying the Union, or for Northerners, how to destroy slavery while preserving the Union, was a political problem specific to a particular time and place. And that's what this book is about. But the moral problem of how to reconcile irreconcilable values, that is, the destruction of slavery, and the preservation of the Union. That's a timeless problem that sooner or later confronts us all. So thank you very much. End of speech. Happy to take some questions. Thank you so much for th this wonderful presentation. I have two kind of categories of questions. The first one has to do with some details around the fugitive slave law itself, and the second is how we teach history about slavery. So the first one is, and forgive me if these are naive questions, so are you, do you talk about uh, how successful slaves were that managed to break free from wherever they were? Did they have to get to Canada to be safe? How many of them were returned? What happened to them when they were returned? So that's one. Right. And the other is kind of in the category of 
how good are we about teaching slavery, let's say on the high school level, or in general, it seems to me there are, there are people that are similar to Holocaust deniers, that slavery wasn't that bad. So could you address that, and then how well we teach slavery in general, let's say on the high school level? Yeah. Let me take the second part yeah. first, if I may. You know, as I tried to suggest in my <clears throat> initial remarks, this is really hard stuff to talk about. And one way to deal with the difficulty is to not talk about it, which is the wrong way. My own view, and I try to do this in my own teaching, and I'm sure not successfully all the time by any means, is to try on the one hand to convey as best we can the depth of the horror and, the, and the, all the different variations in which the horror came. I mean, it was one kind of slavery if you were a field slave on a plantation in the deep south. It was another kind of slavery if you were uh, owned by somebody in Maryland and hired out to work for an employer in Baltimore and allowed to keep some of your wages. And Frederick Douglass, one of the great authorities on the subject, is very good at saying, you know, I, and he said this to his white audiences quite candidly, he said, I, I kind of know you want to hear about all the physical horrors, the whipping and the blood and, and the paraphernalia of slavery, as he called it. But I want to talk to you about the psychological horror, what it means to be an unfree person, what it means to be frightened at the idea that you might move because you're being moved against your will, not by volition. So we have to do what we ever we can and tried to suggest how limited it is, but we ought to try anyway, to convey to our students, high school students, college students, grade school students, something of the horror of what it meant for human beings to live in a state of unfreedom. That's the first task. But if we're going to be faithful to the complexity of history, we can't then just go to the next easy step, which is to say, well, there were these really good people who saw the truth and fought the good fight, and everybody else was a child of Satan. It wasn't that simple. It's never that simple. Good people were trying to figure out what to do in a society that had inherited this hor horrifying institution. And people had all kinds of different ideas about how to get out of this situation. So I think we have an obligation to try to convey that, if for no other reason than to help our students understand that there are people in our own society whom we may look at and say, you know, these people don't even deserve, I mean, they're inhuman, they're insensitive, they're corrupt, they're the worst. And if we don't, but if we don't find a way to talk across that, boundary, we're heading in a similar direction to where the United States went 150 years ago. So that's, that's a, <laughs> teaching is a hard business. And that, that's my best stab at, at that one. Now, the first part of your question is a little more concrete and specific. The reality is, historians can't figure out how many slaves actually escaped to freedom. The numbers are all over the map. Some will say roughly 1,000 a year. Some will say up to 25 or 50,000 a year. And uh, a, a good many of them did end up in Canada, which is where they w were found legal security and rel relative security. Others sort of disappeared underground into free black communities, including here in Washington. There was a large free black community here in Washington long before the abolition of slavery. Uh, so there, there, there are many answers to that question, and I can't, I can't put a, num a number on it. But what I can say is that the exodus of slaves from the Upper South was sufficiently large and sufficiently continuous that the slave owners were extremely anxious about it and felt that at any moment the floodgates might open and their slaves might just kind of walk away and suddenly 
they would be left economically ruined because slaves were the main part of their, of their capital assets. Now, that's not to say we want to sympathize with them, but it is to say that we want to try to understand what it meant to be in a situation like that. And some of them were no doubt decent people who thought of themselves as behaving in a humane and civilized way toward these people whom they owned. If we can't th make the effort to think ourselves imaginatively into that situation, then I think we're telling an oversimplified historical story. So that's the great you. questions. Thank Sorry you. to go on so long about them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm kind of a follow-up question. So if a 1,000 people, even let's say half of 25,000 people were fleeing, in reality that didn't threaten the economic system, the slavery system. Right. So my question is kind of a different one. How much was this Fugitive Slave Act really a political um, effort by the South to in a threatened South, not threatened by actual reality on the ground, like, for example, voter fraud now, which doesn't really exist. How much of it was in reality their fears and their defensiveness and their political power to, in fact, stamp their system on the United States as a whole and enforce their fears and ideology on a North um, that was becoming increasingly less sympathetic, though it's hard to even imagine at that point most northern voters really cared about it too much um, other than the elites and, you know, really weren't, they were interested in other things right. when it came to voting. Right. So, right. Um, it's, a great, it's a great question and it's kind of irresistible for me to give a somewhat presentist answer. There is an analogy with the immigration crisis of our own time. It's not about numbers, right? I mean, the reality is, the reality is that since President Trump came into office and has been going on and on about this invasion of our country, I guess he didn't use that word till recently, but uh, there's been a greater outflow than inflow of immigrants on the southern border, right? So the perception of the, on the part of those who believe that we have an immigration crisis, that these are large numbers of dangerous people or that they're coming to take the jobs away from hardworking native-born Americans and so on, that perception has very little to do with reality. I'm not saying that we don't need some kind of border control and some kind of rational immigration policy, but the rhetoric about what the problem is is way beyond the actuality of, of the situation. And that was true in the 1840s and 50s about the fugitive slave problem, which I think was implied in your question. Nevertheless, and historians disagree about this, but, you know, it's kind of a counterfactual question. Was the South in, the, in charge? Were they in the saddle? Were they the holders of the levers of power? Well, you could say, yes, in a certain way, they controlled, until the mid-1850s, they controlled the Congress. They, mo most of the presidents uh, up to the middle of the 19th century were slave owners. They had a dominant uh, uh, force on the Supreme Court. All of that is true. But when someone like John C. Calhoun, who whatever else we might think of him, was a very intelligent man, when he said in 1850, the South is being crushed, the power of the North is becoming predominating, he was not entirely off the wall with that viewpoint. The population of the North was growing rapidly. If these Western territories were going to be admitted to the Union as free states, which is what the Republican Party s insisted they would be, the um, northern majority in the Congress would grow and grow and grow. Eventually, that would translate into the Supreme Court and the presidency. And this, I, I think it's fair to say that southern slave owners felt extremely back on their heels and defensive about the prospects of their own survival, long-term survival, if they thought one or two or three generations ahead in the United States. 
there may be an analogy to that too in our present political situation. That is the aggressive rhetoric of the right, which seems, has seemed in recent years to be in an ascendancy situation, to my ears sounds like people who feel like they're on the losing side of history. That's what I kind of want to believe. So, so I'm trying to suggest to you that you're right, that it was a psychological problem and a political problem more than an actual problem. Although, if you were a slave owner in Kentucky or in Maryland and you were watching the politics of your state kind of move away from the politics of the Deep South, of Louisiana and Alabama, and start to, you know, plans for gradual abolition being discussed in the state legislature and some slave owners emancipating their slaves, you could, you could believe that your way of life was coming to an end and that the fact that the North was doing nothing to protect you against the risk entailed in losing your human property was a big problem for you and your family. That's something that I think we have to understand. They, some people genuinely believed. Yeah, of course, all those proposals, they would have paid the slave owners, you know, and they wouldn't have lost their mm. property. They just would have had their way of life modified. Right, and, and Lincoln discovered, I mean, as, as late as the early years of the Civil War, Lincoln was still trying to persuade slave owners in the states that had stayed in the Union, in Delaware, where there were like a couple of thousand slaves to accept a compensated emancipation program, and he could never get anywhere with it. Right? Anyway, great questions. Thank you. A couple, yeah. um, it's a little high for this evening. Okay. Okay, so I guess I think people's character potential doesn't really change or hasn't really changed. So thinking more psychologically, in the South, religion and the religious leaders, so what role did they play or do you think they could they have? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Well, you know, the short answer is that the churches split before the country did. So the various Protestant denominations it, it, the northern churches were either aggressively anti-slavery or at least unfriendly towards slavery, and the southern denominations found a way to use the same religion as a pretext for the defense of slavery. Lincoln says in, the, in his great second inaugural address when he's looking back at this whole era, he says both sides read the same Bible and both sides pray to the same God. He's talking about both sides in a war. Know, but why would they have done that? What, what's the motivation? Well. <laughs> I, what, is it just because that was how it was actually seen then? Well, you know, the, you're asking me a deep question, and we'll be here all night if I try to uh, give you a, a good answer. The, you know, we all believe that we can see the truth in the faith that we believe in or the text that we read but we can always find somebody else as articulate as we are who's read the same words mm -hmm. who finds exactly the opposite meaning in them mm -hmm. so southerners loved paul's epistle to philemon mm -hmm. and they read it as instruction that mm -hmm. if a slave runs away from his master mm -hmm. the slave should be returned but Northerners you, like Deuteronomy, I can't remember the chapter and verse, where the instruction is the opposite. If a slave runs to you, give him sanctuary, give him Do refuge. you think it could have changed sl slowly? That that's, the, that's, the, mm -hmm. that's the hardest question about American history, and nobody can answer it. Okay. Because it's a counterfactual. A lot of people wanted to believe that with time, people would come to the understanding that slavery was an intolerable and unchristian institution and it would go away. But how long would it have taken? Would it have ever happened if the economic interest had remained so large as, as this? 
Well, there you go. Well, one of the things that religion can do is to make people feel okay with the way they live. <laughs> right? My view is that religion is supposed to make you feel uncomfortable with the way you live and be interested in changing it. But these are really deep questions. This is like would take the whole Sunday or Saturday to deal with. Come, two more questions. Yeah. Uh, just, I'm sorry if I missed it earlier. What year was the act in, imposed? 1850. And about what would they motivate a northern sheriff or something like somebody like that to catch somebody? How much money would it take to motivate people to take well, some that's an, citizen? Well, that's an interesting question because one of the provisions of the of the <clears throat> of the of the law was that if you were uh, a, a court officer or a justice of the peace and you uh, returned a fugitive to slavery, you got ten dollars. If you made the decision not to return the fugitive, you got $5. And the abolitionists seized that and said, look, this is bribery, pure and simple. It puts the incentive on the side for these officials to send them back. I'm not quite sure that's really true, that, uh, but that argument was, was in the air. What was the incentive? I mean, yeah, there, were, there was a financial incentive, but believe it or not, I and mean, this is when I read the stuff about William Greenleaf Elliott, T.S. Eliot's grandfather, I was trying to get at that. There were people who really believed that whether they personally hated slavery or not, they were obliged to obey the law. And if you were a justice of the peace or a U.S. marshal or one of these new U.S. commissioners and, and you had an affidavit from a man who said, this, this guy ran away from me two years ago, it was your obligation under the law to send him back. And it's, those are the people that I'm kind of most interested in in this book because you see, them so, you see them wrestling with themselves. In one case, there's a guy in Boston who sends a fugitive back and then spends the next 10 years trying to raise the money to buy his freedom. And that's the kind of thing that I'm tr trying to get at where not so simple. Last question. Right. So you've, you're really, in my opinion, have led up to the question I'm going to ask you. I mean, we go back and we reflect on the amount of death in the Civil War itself and, and the consequences after it. I mean, it wasn't as though slavery just stopped yeah, and ended. Right. Okay. So I'm going to ask you an almost unanswerable question. My favorite kind. <laughs> <laughs> Gets me off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> right. It seems to me that there's something in our species that is, gets disturbed, particularly when they, they feel their, their system and their well-being is being threatened. And you can say that in a lot of different ways. So what I'm asking is, if you want to use the Civil War or, or the situation as an example, or you want to, I mean, this happens all over the world. I mean, you go anywhere, through Africa, you know, Bosnia, the whole thing. Do you see anything positive that might have caught where they could have broken this down into a problem with a solution as opposed to just everybody getting up in arms and, and fearful of their own well-being? Is do you see anything possible that way? You know, you're right. It's an unanswerable question. Yeah. <laughs> but it's Be one we have to try and answer. It, 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 you know, historians, that's how a lot of historians make a living, is arguing about that particular question. And my colleague Eric Foner, who's a great Civil War historian, likes to say, basically there are two schools of thought about the Civil War. There's one that believes that Senator Seward was right when he used the famous phrase, this is an irrepressible conflict. It could not have been prevented. It was inevitable. It was built in to the reality. And then there's the school of thought that says, if only the political system had been allowed to work its way a little longer, if people had been more patient, now of course that means white people being more patient with how many more years black people should put up with being enslaved, that eventually there would have been some accommodation and you know, maybe the, North, the, the, the border states would have seen that they should give up slavery, maybe something would have happened in the cotton industry so that the 
price of cotton would have gone down and the commitment of the plantation owners would have slackened. Who can say? Who or, knows? Or boycotts or, or all right. those kinds right. of alternatives. Right. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad you asked this question at the end because I can't answer it, but what we can do, I think, is appreciate that there were serious, decent people at the time who were asking this question. Should we push this to a confrontation that will inevitably end in violence? Nobody had any idea how violent it was. Nobody in, before any war, nobody has any idea how bloody it's going to be. Remember what Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld told us at the beginning of the Iraq war that they were, were going to be there for a couple of weeks and their people were going to come out with flowers and thank us for liberating them, and how many years ago was that? That was uh, 17 years ago? Nobody had, so, but there were people who said, we don't want to go down the path to war because that will take us God knows where. Do we want to judge them now and say that they were cowardly, they didn't care about black people, they were indifferent to slavery? Some of them were, some of them weren't, like Mr. Elliot. So I say to my students, and I'll, maybe I'll end with this, I'm in the confusion business. I take my job to be to scramble people's minds about who was on the right side and who was on the wrong side of difficult questions. And if that comes across through this book, while you can still read it as a compelling narrative, that would be great. Thank you very much for coming out. Hello.